What's up, everybody? Welcome back. Another episode of Food for Thought right here on Roto Grinders. Man, do we have a jam-packed episode here. We are still on the edge of our seats waiting on Chief story time from two weeks ago. So if you've been following along, you probably just full of anticipation and anxiety yourselves here. Anyway, I'm the loose Justin Carlucci. Been another wacky week of NFL football. The Jaguars rolled the Chargers. I don't even have to say anything more about how crazy this season has been. Will Priester's here with us. I'll throw it over to you first, buddy. How are you, man? I am good, man. Super pumped to come on. Uh, I'm not going to say who our special guest is. I'll let you do the honors, but I, I am I am thrilled to be able to hang out with the man, the myth, the legend, and uh, that, that's all I have to say about that. Man, those are some warm some warm uh, regards. Those, those are some. Is yeah. that for me, or is there somebody else who's coming on? Because that's actually what. <laughs> as soon as you said that, that's I was like, I immediately my immediate thought was, oh, they, there's another guest. Like it's not that. That's good, so. <laughs> Who's, who else is in the lobby? Are we gonna let I, don't him in? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's you. And and thanks for joining Thank us. Yeah, man. Berg, Adam Rosenberg. I don't want to steal your thunder. No, you're not. This okay. is your show. I'm, just, just, I'm not. I'm I'm a humble guest of your show. I just have the scores up from yesterday so that I can just see what's going on. But I, I and I work with you guys. But though I don't get to work. I work with you guys, though. I don't get to interact with you like this enough because my job is just to take all the things that you guys do and tell the world about it. And so I go into like my Twitter or pod or just the hype man spider hole. And then you never hear from me for a couple of weeks. <laughs> and that's it. And then, then suddenly an article comes out that says, Justin Carlucci on VEASAN talking about the Titans and don't underestimate them. And you know, those really? kind of days. <laughs> <those takes>, so. <laughs> You let me on TV well, well, to, to say those things. You did great. You did so well. You were you. you were a delight. You were a delight on television. Wow. Now I'm gonna blush. I don't know if we're having video, but <laughs> man. Well, I, I don't know if I'm gonna make it to television. I'm the only person that thinks Aaron Rodgers is trash. So I think Aaron Rodgers. There you I, have it. I think Aaron Rodgers is trash. I think I I agree with the at one of our you know we all work for better collective companies at one of the other better collective companies Vegas Insider. Tom uh, Tom Carroll has a very good comment about Aaron Rodgers. He's simply a weirdo, and he's a weirdo. And like, look, I'm super. I'm look, like ayahuasca is great. All these things are like I've I've gone to Burning Man multiple times, but you know what? Aaron Rodgers makes Burning Man not cool. So like, he just he he also wants to be a game. Like all real, it's very clear. Like he wants to be he like he wants to be a uh, he wants to run a media company. Like he wants to be in charge of a media thing he wants to have a microphone he doesn't he doesn't want to i don't think he cares about football as he does like having an audience how how extensive is your rolodex <laughs> can you get in touch with aaron Rodgers? <laughs> no but though he though i live in northern california and he's from chico but he doesn't uh doesn't he not talk to his family yeah he doesn't he doesn't talk to his family anymore his brother who's on the bachelor told everybody that like they got rid of him i don't know something like that so. Weird. Well, Chief hates him, so maybe we won't have him on. on the well, show. well, hates a strong word. I think the media has given him too much credit for the uh, Packers' ultimate success, and then they still never win anything. So that that's that's really my gripe. The, the media is trying to make him Tom Brady, and he's not Tom Brady. He's that's a fair Aaron point. Roger. That's that's what's happened. Everybody says he's one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time, and then I check, and I'm like, where are the championships? And look, so, it's more than championships, but you, you get what I'm saying here. Like, you can't just go to the NFC championship every year and lose and then be the greatest of all. It doesn't work like that. At, at home, a lot of those times. Oh, home. man. Oh, that San Francisco loss just, last year was ugly. But don't get me oh. started. I, I can go on an Aaron Rodgers rabbit hole all day. I love every, it. I every love pod. This. I love and, it. Uh, but I, I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to be gracious with our guests <laughs> and uh, avoid <laughs> the Aaron Rodgers rabbit hole. That's all right. Yeah, that we would have to take out another time block probably if we went if we went down that street. Uh, but yeah, so uh, you're officially the head of communications in PR. Yeah. I think I think I got that right. So yeah, yeah. You know, so like, do you? How do you explain to people what what you do for a living? You guys, I, this is always an interesting <laughs> discussion, right? It's like, are you a are you a a bookie? No. Yeah. Well. Yeah. No. That's that's so that's this is like the explanation I do with my parents. So when I tell my parents. Oh, I work in sports media 
and I do, my dad says, well, you talk a lot about betting. And I'm like, well, betting is really integrated into sports media. And my mom will say, are you a bookie? And I'd say, I wish I was a bookie. And also they're called agents now. They're not called bookies, mom. Um, but uh, <laughs> no, it, it's, I um, like for what I do, um, my job is, my job's awesome. I get to hype my friends, my colleagues and the industries. I get to talk about sports for a living. It's pretty cool. And um I at the fundamental core, it's like I take the cool stuff that we're doing and I make sure that other people know about it and give our give our talent, which is you guys, a platform so they can tell more people, hey, don't start Aaron Rodgers this weekend. Start Cooper Rush. Like take a chance. Do it. It's contrarian. Do it. Be <laughs> contrarian. Be very be very contrarian. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, I I mean, it's a tough discussion. It's like you don't want to throw the G word around. I'm into gambling. So it's like I'm in sports information. You know, I work in sports info. I mean, yeah, but I mean, or or something like that. I mean, what? 32. First of all, like, that's the thing is like sports betting is legal. So like it shouldn't be taboo. It is legal. It is very it is legal to bet on sports. It is what a world more. It is legal to bet more legal to bet on sports in seven in like 31 states because you can do it on your phone. And, um, but the whole thing is like, people just aren't used to it from the last couple of years. And also people are very bad at it. So they're just like, Oh, you just, you just lose tons of money doing it. Well, you can lose grotesque amounts of uh, grotesque amounts of money, not being smart about it. Or you could just lose normal amounts of money being into it, which is like what we all are, you know, like as, as, as me as a casual. So, yeah, no, I, I've <laughs> been to a couple of weddings in the past couple of months, you know, making table small talk and, Go into a festival this weekend, not like a drugs and take your clothes off festival, though. Not like the abomination of Woodstock '99. I don't know if you see the Netflix documentary, though, but it was, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but um, I'm taking this girl and I might run into her parents, so I'm like prepping the what do you do for a living? I'm an editor, I'm just nodding my head and, and, and say yes. And if there's any follow up questions, we'll just roll with it. That uh, chief, I mean, I'm sure you've had discussions with a hey, chief. Well, I don't know. Do, who, do people at home call you chief or do, like, do we just call you chief? So, I've always I, thought to call you chief. Like, from my first day, they said to call you chief. Ironically, uh, my girlfriend calls me chief Ooh. Uh, oh. and will and, and will. And uh, sure. so, you know, it's it's an interesting dynamic when someone supports your your career, so to speak. And so she's she's fine calling me chief. She's fine being Mrs. Chief. Soon, soon to be, uh, soon to getting be. that later, but uh, so yeah, but but mostly she calls me well, mostly, but you know, sometimes I'll be in the house and she'll say, Hey, chief, I'll be like, Oh, what, what a what a delightful sound! <laughs> <laughs> my wife, my wife calls me, calls me Adam, my wife and my mom call me Adam, and uh, oh wow, blocked field goal, did that you know? I guess it didn't go in. Um, my wife and my mom call me Adam. And everybody else calls me Berg. And I've been Berg since I was in eighth grade when there was this show called Two Guys, A Girl, and a Pizza Place. And Ryan Reynolds was on it. And he was like really sarcastic. And his name was was Berg. And one of my friends, Jen Piston, was like, hey, your last name's Rosenberg. We should shorten that and just call you Berg. And then I said, all right, cool. And it just like literally stuck forever. And, um, so there's like, but I, I just kind of Berg and, and Adam Rosenberg are the same Northeast Jewish kid who grew up listening to fish and loves the Eagles. So I, I try not to make anything, anything different about what it is, but my yeah, wife definitely cool. always calls me Adam, especially when she's really annoyed with me. So. Cool. <laughs> and, and a happy Rosh Hashanah, by the way. I, I, yes, he, it is new year. You, you would never know by my, my, uh, my last name, but I am also a Northeast Jewish kid. A little, Ooh, conf- little, confu- a little confused growing up. I grew up in, I was born in Long Island, grew up in Pennsylvania, where there's, I'm the Jew. <laughs> I'm the Jew in the book. <laughs> there's one who's just me. So, yeah. um, Except when the kids all go up for camp. <laughs> then they're all there also then it's a bunch of jewish kids all summer i, I can't lie i didn't really i didn't really practice i, I I'm, I'm kind of a fraud and a lot of my like my non-blood family that became my I, family kind of did christmas so i was like um well, i don't know what i am but i'll figure it out dude i literally <laughs> for, i was the, so i was the jewish kid who grew up around all irish catholic kids um <laughs> and so i played hockey and so i stunk at tennis like all these other jewish kids i i met and i stunk i was really bad at basketball um and played you know played hockey and i and you know my wife is catholic 
our daughter is Nora Margaret Rosenberg. And actually I emailed a rabbi that I know locally today just to apologize for not going to Rosh Hashanah and remembering it at all, except for the fact that I took the time. The only thing I take the time to do on Rosh Hashanah was post this meme that I love <laughs> every year. That's just as a guy blowing a shofar and it says, shofar is so good. <laughs> and it's great and it's great and i'm just like i'm gonna throw this up on the work chat it's, it's, it's 2022 every, we got stuff to every do year, every <laughs> year i do that <laughs> oh that All was right. good cool sorry i didn't mean to do hey, that no that was that, that, this so okay adam so let's talk about this yes yeah, it's bird. bird this show is all about the derail that's okay. that's what makes the okay cool show. well i i the derail but, is the show i mean <laughs> i i took three weeks of improv class and that's how I got into PR. So like I can derail very easily. <laughs> so I love let it. Me know. <laughs> I mean, I guess we should talk some football. Let's do it. Um, our, our, first segment, it. our first segment, uh, which kind of, we just rolled with last season of the show was called elephant in the room where we just have to address some of the obviousness and uh, chief, where do you want to kick us off? I mean, there are some lopsided scores and some surprises on Sunday. Um, Damn, uh, it was a wild week. So what what's on on your brain here? Uh, I, I think the elephant in the room for me is a compilation of good teams losing. And I think we saw this last year around this time for whatever reason. I mean, you know, the Raiders go down to the Titans. You know, perhaps, perhaps the Raiders are the elephant in the room and perhaps they stink and we're still trying to make them great because Come on. Devontae Adams is there. I, I think maybe maybe they got a little bit too much hype early, and now the real Raiders are continuing to show up. And the fact is, they stink. Uh, I, it's three weeks in. Maybe they turn it around. They've got some injuries in their division with the Chargers. Uh, I don't see them. I still don't see them beating the Chiefs at all. It, it's going to be tough sledding uh, for for the Las Vegas Raiders, and uh, that's. Mm, it, it, Devontae Adams, I, I, man, I'm, I'm pouring one out for my man right now. Like his, his season is not off to a great start outside of that week one explosion. And so you had them losing. You had, of all teams, the Chiefs lose to the Colts. Um, okay, another one. And, and then I'm just going to be quiet and, and let you roll with it. No, no, no. Are, are, the, are the Jaguars good? Oh, like, 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 are, 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 are the Jaguars actually good? Like, this is two weeks in a row now that they've, you know, handedly, uh, you know, come out and just kind of taking care of business. You know, you can only play who's in front of you. And so, you know, they they play the Chargers. They went 38 to 10. Like, so it's not like they won on a last second field goal. You know, some lucky, but it's 38 to 10. Last week, they beat the Colts 24 to 0. And... I don't think it's a coincidence that Doug Peterson's the coach. I, I, I don't think this is a coincidence. I, the Jaguars may, in fact, be the best team in the AFC South. And, and I wow. think I'm true. I, I think that's right. All right. I, I'm done with my elephant in the room take. Uh, back over to you guys. Go ahead, Berg. I agree with that. I want to I, – I know that it's not – I just want to do everything with that elephant. That elephant was – Absolutely perfect. Well, because I mean, mine was going to be the same thing. It was going to be the Jags are good. The Jags are seventh in EPA, which for listeners, I don't know if they listen. It's earned points. Um, it's basically are you scoring points on plays uh, or are you getting closer? Are you moving your offense? And they're fourth in defensive efficiency. And um, like it's we could talk, we could talk all we want about you know the good guy who went to Wyoming and everyone wants to say is an MVP, Josh Allen. But I, but my Josh Allen is a linebacker who eats injured quarterbacks like he did with uh, Mr. Herbert yesterday. Like, not only are the Jags a very healthy two and one, but they were one bad clock management with a young team on the road in game one, in game week one from winning that game. Like, they, they poorly managed the clock because they, they took, well, they had the go ahead score with three minutes left and they didn't use it well. That team is very, very young and it's totally understandable that they would do that. Um, but they really, that was a toss up. That was like a very weird thing, and they could have won that game. I think that the elephant in the room, that the Jags are not just the best team in a in you know one of the two divisions that could possibly be 
relegated from the uh, NFL along with the NFC South. Um, but oh um, they are, <laughs> but they're actually, I, I could, I mean, I, they could, they could, they beat the chargers. I think that they could go toe to toe with Miami. Um, and I think that they could go toe to toe with the Ravens. I mean that there's, I, I think I'm very excited about this game against the Eagles. Um, but that is an elephant in the room for sure. And I, you know, the other one I think is that the uh, the teams that we uh, teams that we've been watching own the space for the last decade. I don't think that they got it much anymore. The Bucks look boring, and Tom Brady looks old, and Aaron Rodgers is a weirdo, and um, <laughs> none of them look exciting. I mean. You could convince me that the Lions are three and zero. I have no idea what the way that I would think that with the way that they're playing. Um, and it's now, just, that's an exciting team that's winning but losing. Winning but losing. They are um, there, as my friend Sean Hardy says. Well, I think he stole it from Bill Simmons, but I'll give him credit because he's my friend. Um, they are a a good bad team. Um, that is probably the most entertaining seven win team max that, that what we're gonna see. But also, like, I mean, the Raiders are probably like a really good six and 11 team you know so um every like every like you want a you know good bet i don't know if you guys talk about that on this show but you want a good bet oh, we do okay cool well every time that the every raiders game has come down to being within a score uh has it not so just and this was the same case last year the raiders have this weird tendency of just like losing focus so that's why i don't think josh mcdaniels is the best coach for them because they lose focus completely but yeah um Bet them, bet them live, bet them for second halves. Just bet them for second halves all the time because it will cash. They, they were one, uh, what a two point conversion. Was it a two? Like I didn't watch the whole game, but were they a two point conversion or were they an actual score with the Titans? Two point. It was they two, point, a conversion. two point conversion. Yeah. Uh, right. Uh, on the flip side. And I don't, I think the jury's still out for my AFC South take because I, I just, I quite frankly just don't know. The Titans were a like week one against the Giants. My soul left my body. Up thirteen nothing at half, just collapsed in the second half. As I'm sitting in an Atlantic City sports book, where I'm the I'm the Titans fan, and like everyone in New Jersey and Long Island was in Atlantic City. So, um, you know, the Titans could be too. I mean, there's a lot of what ifs. Like these games have been crazy, but that was a must win for the Titans to prove their their worth. And again, they almost collapsed in the second half, up twenty four ten in the first half. They've been very good in the first half, and just the play calling has been atrocious. Um, so. I'm definitely going to have a few beers for this Titans Colts game on Sunday because it's like so pivotal, such a pivot, like it's a monumental game so early because with how slow both the Colts and the Titans have started, despite Indy's win over Kansas City, which we could talk about, like tying Houston was just inexcusable, right? Yeah, like, but like the, the third, those those are franchises, I think it's very different modes because like, I mean, here's the thing that I've been pushing about the Titans. Vrabel is, Vrabel is probably the only coach that if his team doesn't do well, he is not on the hot seat at all and yeah. and 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 probably doug peterson because like they're not expecting that but like that titans team is built to be in transition um they they've drafted a quarterback they have their star running back is on the last year of his contract slash they could cut him and not have a lot of dead money they've drafted young guys for future um they've got multiple key defensive players who are out for the season or for lengthy periods of time already and it already it and it's blows. it's so i i think that the pressure on that team is going to change and be a little different because they can midway through be like all right you know what we're actually going to shut down Derrick Henry or we're going to do whatever it is that we're going to do here. Cause like Derrick Henry, like love him to death, but like running backs are supposed to have stopped doing what he's doing. Like for, he was a late bloomer. Like, right. I mean, he's like the Aaron judge of running backs. Like he picked his fourth year to like turn it on. Um, but that, I think that that team like get it, like it's a loaded draft next year, do whatever. Don't worry about it. Like it's hard to tank in football, but that team's not under pressure to win now the way that, you know, the bills got to win now. Like Miami has to win in the next two years. Um, Bucks got to win now. Um, Eagles next couple of years, but like a lot of these teams, like, you know, like the, the, the entire AFC West is a win now division, you know? Yeah. The, the, the Broncos, the chargers, the chiefs, um, who else is left there? Jeez, the, the Raiders. Yeah, yeah, they they've all gotta gotta try to win. I mean, I, I couldn't agree more, man. Like that's 
That's a really good take. And, and I, I must say my Broncos shares to win the division aren't looking great right now. Man, I, I got the same ones, man. I got that. I got Ooh. that. And I got I got so I got that and I got the Chargers right before the trades happened because it was like this is gonna happen. Let me get those both. And look, for all the things about the Broncos, like I was very big on the Broncos last night, and I was I was on an island with this. Like the Broncos up until last night actually moved the ball pretty well. They were the most penalized team and they were 0 for 6 in the red zone. So oh, being the most penalized and 0 for 6 in the red zone are two things that are that are positive regression ends up affecting yeah. that. So, but the problem is is that they played a team that is just as bad in the red zone. So we got awful Sunday night football. Like people forget like Jimmy Garoppolo is a fantastic game manager, but he he's not going to he's never going to throw 30 touchdowns and he has no idea what to do with it. I don't think either team got within the 20, but th- like there's that I mean, that team could do some things, but right now like the Chiefs look more than anything that we've ever seen, the Chiefs look focused. Like they lost yesterday, and like and that was a bad spot um, for them overall. You know, coming off a division win and then going to the Colts, who've like traditionally given them problems. Um, but and it was also a kitchen sink, kitchen sink game with the Colts. Like yeah. it wasn't going to happen. But overall, man, the Chiefs just look pretty focused. Um, and so I, I just I I don't know. I think we're, I feel like we, we're sleeping on arguably one of the best three players that plays in the league and and the rest of his team. You know, you got to love that we're a data driven industry and we're data driven analysts typically, except for this like 60 minutes. We're not. But, um, you know, we have to make assumptions based on like three weeks of sample sizes. So it's, it's just what drives us crazy. It's why football you know, is the best and so much changes from week to week. So, well, that's also why DFS is the best, too. Like, mm-hmm. you know, if if you can adjust quickly and on the fly, you catch something that nobody else catches. You know, you put the content out there, then it's up for people to decide whether you're credible or not and listen. And, you know, it, it, qu- quite frankly, you know, this past week, and I, I'll just kind of use this past week as an example, like I was extremely high on the Bengals passing game, like abnormally high, just because I knew they were going to go to to New York and move the ball relatively easy. Uh, it was just whether or not they could score touchdowns. And once again, you know, McPherson made me a lot of money. Joe Burrow made me a lot of money. And I had a little bit too much, you know, Chase. And so, you know, Boyd and and Higgins go off and Chase is sitting there with like six catches for 29 yards on like 10 or 12 targets or something something like that. And so, you know, it's, it's what happens. You, you put the information together. Uh, you, you try to read it as best you can based on what you see. And you go from there. And uh, – and then secretly, this will be my last thing. If you can get Jameis Winston shares, like they keep giving them to us. I'm just, you know, you guys know I'm heavy in the prop game. They keep giving Jameis Winston to us in this 215 to 225 range. Like, don't they realize he's going to be garbage time Jameis every yeah. single week? Like every week he's going to. Every week. It's crazy. Well, I don't you, understand. You look at his stats and it's the same. It reminds me. I mean, he's a lot more hurt than he, than, than Hertz was last year no pun intended, he is more hurt than Hurts was last year. But for the first six games of the season, um, Jalen Hurts was was crushing it because he was in there in the fourth quarter and he was just throwing them. Like, things aren't – like, the Saints can't put things together. Like, Olave leads the league in in, um, depth of target, like, by Mm -hmm. a long shot, and he's getting, like, nine deep targets a game. On it's a team that's, that's on a team though that's only like forget about that Tampa Bay game like that the wheels fell off after that after that interception like that game was actually was a was a touchdown game like not a four touchdown game but yeah. he's getting those kind of targets despite the fact that the team's like only a touchdown in like a, the Saints are like one of those weird things where all these fluky things are happening but James Winston shares by them he doesn't stink he's just hurt. And he's also working. He also has a defensive coach. I think eventually, the, the one thing that's great on the Saints is that Carmichael, who's their OC, he's been in the system for like I think like twelve years. He's worked on that team for like ten or twelve years. He's been there a while. And the thing is, is that it, you know people talk about Peyton leaving and Sean Peyton leaving, but that teams have the same guys around him, and they've kind of been grooming Jameis for this stuff. I just think he's. I just think he's hurt because that O line's bad. You know. Olave is 26 targets across the last two weeks. Yeah, uh, dude. Like that's where I, I'm gonna, I still think people are sleeping on him too. That's where like I'm gonna go on FanDuel this week and take some alt totals because like, do do it. He's he's on our group on my group text. He's been the one. 
So like we start like what we do is, and maybe you guys, I don't know if you ever guys want to talk about this, like the difference because you guys are big DFS guys and like oh I'm no, a big, I, I'm actually a big prop guy, actually. Okay, big prop guy. Well, but it comes out of the big prop guys, but like I'm a prop guy, I'm a better, but I've gotten more into the prop stuff. And and you know, I try to look for something that everybody else isn't looking at. So like I don't look necessarily I, I hate I hate T D props. But what I love looking at is longest reception props or longest yes. pass props. So like I look for like a perfect situation, like the Bills when 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 Hyde was out, I looked at the chart for Tua of where does he where's he most effective in the field, and he's most effective where your free safety would be, and a all pro free safety on the Bills was going to be out. So I immediately took longest longest uh, pass and. Uh, and then the longest reception, I, I went with Waddle because the pricing was just better and it kind of, you know, things kind of worked out, but, but it's, I, we look at like my, on our dream text, we were just looking at air depth of target and who's getting these things. Like, that's why I was very big on Hollywood Brown. Like Hollywood Brown quietly is getting 21, 25 yard targets consistently. He's getting 12 targets a game and that team stinks. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't know, like what kind of things, like, what do you kind of look at? How do you key in on what you want to look at for a prop? So believe it or not, I keep it really basic. I mean, of course, I'm going to look at a dot. Like, so don't get me wrong. I'm going to look at a dot. But I'm huge on can this team stop the run? Can this team stop the pass? Like, like just the bare. I'm talking the bare basics, right? And then I say, okay, this team's having real problems, right? Like stopping the pass. Okay, where are the lines at compared to where they've been week to week to week? And then, of course, the other thing, too, is, believe it or not, the books are almost like game log watchers, in, in my opinion. So, yeah. you know, Joe Burrow has two bad weeks in a row. So instead of him being at 275 and a half, now he's down to 260. Well, then this week he gets the Jets, who he's going to throw for 300 yards at, like, those are the types of things I like to look at. Um, like, for instance, another one this week that I was, like, super heavy on was James Robinson over 47 and a half rushing yards. People are still saying I said, him what too. Is Bro, he's getting, like, 15 to 18 carries a game. And even if you look at the uh, the market share, like, he's, like, the lead back. And Etienne's, like, the scat back. Etienne's yep. out there, like, 25%. They of the love Etienne, but, like, they love Etienne, but, like, J-Rob's the dude. Yeah, Bob is and, the dude, and he was the dude last year, and he's yes. just like he is the dude. What a league and winner! So, he's a league so the dude. industry. He's, he's a league, he's because he's, he's built like winner. a three down back. He is built like a three down back, and he's going to win you leagues. Whatever, I love whatever I season long, yeah. he's going in the eighth, twelfth round. You know, every, his, oh, coming off like cheap, ACL. cheap credit. His his rush is still capped at forty five yard. Like. The dude's gonna run for like fifteen and eighty every game. Yeah, it was, it was crazy. Passes. And then he got a bump, Bird, and the bump was like fifty-two and a half. I said, "All right, they, what's happening here?" It, yeah. it was crazy. And then you knew that you knew the Chargers were gonna have some some injury wall. I said, "Oh man, this is this is like a smash." So next week he probably comes in at fifty-five and a half. I'm gonna give it fifty-five and a half for week four, um, but. I mean, like, that's the stuff I look at. Like, where are the inefficiencies, really? Like, I don't care. So a lot of people care about whether the player is good or bad. I actually don't care whether or not the player is good or bad. I, I care, is this line efficient or inefficient? If yep. it's inefficient, I've got a hammer. Like, Ezekiel Elliott, as bad as he's been, opened up the season at 41 and a half rushing yards, knowing you're, he's going to get 15 carries no matter what. Like, Zeke can get 50 yards off 15. Do you get what I'm saying? Like that's the sure. stuff I look at. It's yeah. You know, that, that, that's how I approach the prop game. Um, and then, and then a lot yeah. of times I find props that I ride with that I know are going to be successful. Like Evan McPherson over one and a half field goals every week. is like free money. It, since last season too, like not dude's just elite. this year. Yeah, dude's elite. Dude's elite. Like, He's going to kick two field goals a game. And then like coaching tendencies. And that's something I've gotten more into this year. And I know I, this is my rabbit hole on kickers. But some coaches are going to screw you every week. And some you already know. If they, if it's fourth and four on the eight-yard line, they're kicking a field goal. The Bills aren't kicking a field goal fourth and four on the eight. They're going for it. So and you might as well. And neither is Brandon Staley. <laughs> Brandon Staley's not correct, doing it either. Correct. So you might as well not play Tyler Bash. But uh, McManus, 
if, 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 if Denver's there, they're going to kick it. Atlanta, Hungway Koo, I'm telling you, if Atlanta's anywhere near 50 yards, or the, they're going to kick it. They're going to let him kick. Uh, of course, McPherson, Carlson from the Oakland Raiders, if they're within okay, range, yeah. they're going to let him. So th- those Tucker, are the things yeah. I start looking at. Tucker, they're not going to let him kick. I'm telling you, Harbaugh has screwed me on so many kicker props. Well, Doug's, Go- Doug in Jacksonville is really aggressive. and lo- like He was the first – like he was one of the first – head coaches that they were like, yeah, this dude's way too effing aggressive on fourth downs when he was with the Eagles. So yeah. like, I mean, I, you, you can't even think about that on them. I mean, remember, I remember a couple of years ago when Tomlin was like, why would I use Boswell? Why would I use the kicker when like, statistically speaking, it, I have better, I have a better shot with of more points over time. He basically like money balled it and was like, we're ne- and they never went for field goals like the entire year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, dude, you got to look at that stuff. Like it's, you it's, have to, uh, yeah, no, it's a good call out. And it's like, look, the giants game, like I was very close to taking, I didn't end up doing it. I didn't take the the under for like Graham Gano because Dable's already shown. He's like, yo, I got balls, dude. I'm just going to go for two. If I feel like I want to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, James Robinson ninth in the NFL in total opportunities. So it's elite RB one status. <laughs> yeah, sure. dude. Oh, what is it? So, what are the right now? What are the three running backs like? Because two and three are are Cordell Patterson. Who are the three top three running backs right now in the league? In, in opportunity, in, yeah, and and purpose and yards, like combined, like something that I would, uh, would get. Who would, I, well, if you were to if you were to redraft right now, who would be the top three running backs to take right now? This is not dynasty, nothing cute, but like right now, based on performance, right now. I mean. Like you just have to imagine Jonathan Taylor's still in that conversation, right? But yeah, like how far are you how where are you where are you taking Saquon in your redraft now? Where where that's that's the that's the hot topic of RB one talk is where do you take Saquon Barkley? I still take right now? I mean I probably would take Saquon Barkley and I still would take him if I had twelve or at the turn. Because the problem with Saquon Barkley is that Saquon Barkley had had miles on him when he was in, when he came out of college, people ignored this. Like the, the problem with Saquon Barkley is this problem when you have running backs that get cluster injuries, like it doesn't oh, cluster, cluster injuries don't go away, which is one of the things about like Derrick Henry. He got all of his cluster injuries early in his career. Like he hasn't had them since until he had that stuff last year. That's not nor That's not, that's not normal. We want to talk about regression. Like that's a hundred percent, not normal. It's a testament to the Titans having a very good training staff, but like Saquon Barkley, Saquon Barkley, I like to joke, he's an e- he's a future Philadelphia Eagle and he doesn't even realize it. Like he is, <laughs> he is, he is going this is to, hilarious. dude, he is going to get, so he's going to get cut at the end of the year. There's not a doubt in my mind. He'll go somewhere. He's going to sign like a two year, $30 million. Someone's going to give him 30 million. Like, uh, who's going to do it? Probably the Cardinals. Cardinals. No, Cardinals would probably do that. Cardinals would, could do that. Uh, maybe even the, um, Niners, someone's going to do that. Cardinals love throwing money at people. They're going to they're going to cut him out. after a year because he's going to rush for eight hundred yards, seven hundred yards, something like that. He's going to end up on the Eagles by twenty twenty five. He will end up on the Eagles on a one year or twenty twenty four. We'll, I'll even be aggressive. He'll be ending on the Eagles by twenty twenty four on a one year type of prove it, Garrett Blunt style deal. He is a walking Philadelphia Eagle. He has no idea, and he is, and it's just that's. That's just I've had this take for a bit. So. Somebody clip this. <laughs> <We'll> clip this. <laughs> you, you know what? He's the hometown kid. Whitehall High School, Whitehall he PA, is. Lehigh yeah. Valley, Penn State did his thing. You're right. He's coming home. Yeah, I, I, he's I'm coming not home. Will, I'm not willing to timestamp it, but I'll timestamp. Timestamp it of 24 or 25. That's when it's gonna happen. I love it. I love it. Anything else we uh, want to address? I mean, we hit we hit a lot of hit a lot of pretty uh pretty big ones. Um well, I mean, you guys like so. Who's the best team in the? So, are, are the Rams? Are the Rams still good? That's my question. Oh boy! So, here's the thing. I feel like the Rams are still good. I I felt like they were going to get blasted week one on Super Bowl hangover because the Bills are hungry, right? Mm-hmm. And, I, and I'm going week to week here. Like they played the Falcons. I mean, I figured they beat the Falcons. I think the Rams get better the later the year goes along, in my in my opinion. 
I think at some point, and I'm basing it off of last year, and I could be wrong, but I'm looking at what they'll have as long as they, they get healthy and as long as they still have the pieces. So Odell Beckham gets there like middle of the season, almost at the end last year. Robert Woods goes down, and Cooper Cup is still the man. Like he he's that offense, right? It's yep. it's pretty much built around him. It's not even built around the running game. The offense is built around Cooper Cup. I don't care. What, just look at his routes. Look at how they design the plays. It's built around him. Okay, that, that so we settled that. But you look at how Odell progressed in this offense. And he got better, 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 like week to week to week to week as he got more integrated. And I know Allen Robinson had like spring training and stuff like that, but I think he gets better week to week to week to week to. And I know last week it didn't look like it, but by week six, I think Allen Robinson is like, okay, we're good now, right? Now, mm-hmm. now he's got two weapons. By then, I'm sure Van Jefferson's back or, or really cl- like really close. Well, they need that because there's nobody stretching the field. At Correct. All. Correct. And so now you get that element. Tyler Higby, as long as he's healthy, they'll be rolling. They'll have this two running back. They're going to stay in 11 personnel. And all of a sudden, you look in the middle of the season, you go, oh, no, oh, no. the Rams are scoring 31 points a game. Yep. And nobody, and it's hard. And they're, they're going to be hard to beat because by then, the defense is either going to – they're going to get with the program or somebody's going to stick up their butts. Like, they've got Madonna on that defense. They're all alphas. Like Ramsey wants to be good. Like he, he may not be as good as he was in Jacksonville, but he wants to cause havoc. Uh, um, geez, all the guys they got on the line. Like it's it's not just Aaron Donald. They got other guys too. Like no, it's they Floyd want- and all, Floyd's like the key cog to that entire line. Well, because he moves out from the linebacker spot and he allowed like people like Donald doesn't play every down. None of those guys play every down. They play sixty six percent of their downs. They rotate well. Yeah. So I I think you know. Week six or seven, like, you're going to look and say, oh, no, here come the Rams yet again, and they're going to be a problem um, as they continue to get healthy. Is it weird that I'm still, like, unsure of Miami? Am I going to get crucified for that? No, 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 but, like, it's fair. It's I mean, tell me, why? I, you know, a win's a win, right? Like, who am I to, who am I to judge the Miami Dolphins? I mean, this is the – Oh man, Craig's gonna kill me if he's listening to this, probably. But um, <laughs> you know, like they have no run game. I I, I just I want to see what happens when slash if they don't have Tyreek or Waddle for a period of time. I well, I, that's not a fair. That's it, not fair because that's fair. how their team's built. Like it's very. It, that's it, not. It's, it's it's fair, but I I also I also like. I think the defense is a little overrated. I mean, they really struggled. I do think the defense is a little with speed overrated. on the outside. Yeah. I, I mean that wasn't that was a fair, what a like what a what a monumental win against Baltimore, but that was more of a collapse, I think, on the yes, Ravens. That was part. much more but well so, if, if that was much more um you know, again, like shout out to Sean Hardy, who's a big Ravens fan, as much more Baltimore's failure on defense than it had anything to do with um I mean, if you're gonna play well, they play like one back, one deep, and like and they just let themselves get eaten. And that was it was terrible. And then and the Ravens also didn't re- figure out how to run out the clock. I I, I just eventually they're going to have to tr- run the football. They're averaging three yards a carry. Um, you know they had this collection of guys that they brought in, and that's usually a bad sign, right? You have Mostert, um, Mostert, and yeah, former have- Eagle, former mm-hmm. Eagle, uh, who was cut after leading the NFL in the preseason. Chip Kelly cut him. Chip Kelly. Oh. <laughs> It's amazing that the Eagles were able to. It's amazing I remember well that. But did. like, it's also not amazing that I remember yeah, that. I have all weird Eagles I'm facts. so sorry that you. I mean, I have a ton of, of Eagles fans, friends, but you had to live through the Chip Kelly. Here's a smoothie era. Like that's what he wanted. He's, oh, you're gonna come to a birthday. Uh, well, we're gonna make was, you smoothies. What was worse was I was living in California. Again, we're der- I'm derailing the conversation. The um, I was living in California, and all my friends were from Oregon. And so they were just like, oh, you're getting Chip Kelly. I'm like, oh, my God, this is going to be great. And he got uh-huh. there and, like, he pissed everybody, managed to piss everybody off in a span of 12 months. Like, I'm very everybody. good at pissing people off. And, like, <laughs> I can't even accomplish it. you got to try very hard to bother that many people. He's just like – he was – I think the comparison that was made about, J- about Chip Kelly was it was it was like when your most drunk fantasy football league mate takes over an NFL franchise and just goes, wee! Like, <laughs> he gained money to like 
you know, DeMarco Murray uh, got a bunch of money. He managed to somehow get into like, he managed to piss off Deshaun Jackson and it pretty much derailed Deshaun Jackson's career after that because he was never uh, really the same. Um, he managed to break multiple quarterbacks um, and did win the division his first year, though. So, yeah, I, you know, two thirds of your job, or maybe that's. Maybe that's an over-exaggeration. 50% of your job as a professional coach is to manage personalities. Yeah, manage so bad at it. It was so the bad worst. Oh, and, you know, I'm in Northeastern PA, and you know Northeastern PA. 94, you know, uh, the all the radio stations were unlistenable. Froggy. Froggy. Is Froggy <laughs> still there? Uh, I don't know. I, okay. I, I grew up and got serious. Okay. In the car. <laughs> but um, anyway, like, I'm not going to get you on the showberg and not have you talk about your Eagles. So it, sure. it will we'll segue to, you know, some games or some things we're yeah, looking at. Let's do it. Maybe a little bit of DFS pricing. And uh, the team of the hour, the Jacksonville Jaguars, are taking on your Eagles next week. So yes, they like, are. on a scale of one to 10, how, how terrified are you of the Jacksonville Jaguars? Um, not. Uh, it's they're, they're still an extremely young team. Like the reasons why I love the Eagles that are young are the reasons why the Jags, like, look, I, the Jags were the first bet I made after the Super Bowl. I bet the Jags to win the Super Bowl this year at like 150 to one, bet Trevor Lawrence to be MVP at 100 to one. But that's, those are system plays. Like, that's second year quarterbacks. Like, for every listener's bets, always take every second year quarterback, throw 10 bucks at them to win MVP in their second year. It is, the odds are in your favor to eventually you'll hit like this is a Lamar rule. It's a Mahomes rule. Like the new NFL is built around this. So um, I, I took those, but that team is very young. The Eagles have it very young. I'm a little bit, I, I the Eagles also need to get punched in the mouth. Like, so, um, but you know, I just love all these people who are just like, Oh, I was always around with Jalen hurts. And there's a, there's a code in, philadelphia apparently where if you don't want a like there's a whole thing like philadelphia i have a thing about philadelphia sports writers i don't think the philadelphia sports writers have ever really wanted a black quarterback to succeed it's just i just felt that is like a thing for like a while like they were really they were really on McNabb, calling for like kevin cobb like you know vic as soon as there was a problem there was a thing like it, it's just like but carson wentz could could do no wrong and it you know I, it's sort of like, and it's coded through the words of too athletic and too mobile. And I'm like, just say that you want him to be white and like it, Philadelphia beat reporters don't do this, but that's really what it is. I love watching Jalen hurts, throw the ball, run the ball and do everything and do it quietly. Like an incredible leader that he is like Tim McManus from ESPN. And he's a Philly sports writer too wrote this incredible piece about what Jalen Hurts has been doing basically for the last two years since he was drafted and how he preps and how he gets together with all the guys after practice and how nobody was like helping him out. He just wanted to do it. Like that guy, like that guy lost his starting job at three different colleges. You have to be a solid leader and a good human being to not quit. Yeah. Like I would quit if someone replaced my job at three different jobs and they said, you know what you're, we're going to have someone else do it. I would stop doing that job. And the guy didn't like, I mean, I love Jalen Hurts. I'm all in. And he was benched in the biggest game of his life for two. the biggest life. And uh, it's cool to see both of them having success on two very competitive teams this season. Yeah. So. I love it. Well, you know, like all the things are, you know, the OC was for, for that, for that Alabama team. Mm. Dable. Oh, I forgot about that. And who are the only three and O teams? Dolphins with Tua, Eagles with Hertz, Giants with Dable. Man, I need that Brian Windhurst meme with your oh. with your face on it. <laughs> yeah. Why? Why would now? Why would I say that? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That that was a good nugget right there. Yeah, that yeah, was yeah. a good yeah, one. Yeah, I found that out today, and I was like, "Oh, when am I going to ever use this in my life?" I'm like, "Oh, I'm friends with Justin. I'll find a time." <laughs> <laughs> Six and a half point uh, favorites. The Eagles are chief. What are your thoughts on Jalen Hurts this season and what you've seen out of him so far? Um, well, I have the same thoughts that I had when I heard that A.J. Brown was coming over. And it wasn't that A.J. Brown was going to, you know, tee off every game. It's about what I feel like an organization is telling their quarterback when they go out and get a bona fide wide receiver from another team. We're, we want you to be successful, right? You, you go out and get A.J. Brown, you're saying, hey, man, look, this is it. We're, we're giving you the tools you need. Um, and I'm going to parlay that into 
uh, another guy, say what you want. Miami goes out and gets Tyreek. What are they telling Tua? Tua, hey, we're, we're gonna we're, we want you to be successful. We're, we're, we're going to give you what we think you need that's going to help push this offense forward. So for me, I'm not shocked that Miami's scoring points. I'm not shocked that the Eagles are scoring points. Like, what does A.J. Brown do for this offense that Devontae Smith does not? He gives Devontae Smith the free reign to run around. He's a yak machine. Like, that, 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 that's what he does. Like, you know, why do you think – hear me out here. I'm going, I'm going throw back to Pittsburgh. Why is Juju Smith-Schuster such a beast with Antonio Brown? You can't cover them both. You've got to decide, okay, who are we taking away today – and let's make the other one beat you. Well, the other one can beat you. That's the problem. And that's the problem you're going to see in Miami. That's the problem you're going to see in Philly. You can decide that you want to take away Devontae Smith. But if you do that, you're saying A.J. Brown gash us for 150 today. If you take away A.J. Brown, you're saying Devontae, go ahead and gash us for 160. And if you decide to take them both away, well, you know, you're not going to be able to cover uh, the it. running backs. with them. It's, it's like, what, what are you going to do? He's going to burn a linebacker every time. You know, Hurts is going to take off and run. Not every play, but, you know, how many times have we seen these guys just go, hey, everybody run down the field, the, the defender's back's turned, and Hurts just starts running. It's crazy. Like, I'm like, how have, you, how have you not figured this out? But they have not. And that that's what, that's what I think I'm seeing in Philly. The extra big-time wide receiver on the outside is only going to help this team, their offense – get better, which in, in a sense is going to energize your defense. Like, look, adrenaline is real, and, and it happens, right? It comes out, you know, they're pumped up, and sometimes they can work against them. They're too excited. They miss an assignment. I get it. But essentially, you know, mentally they're feeling better. They know if they get a stop, their team's going to score, right? It's, it's, it's confidence. And so now I think in Philly, even after three games, they've got some confidence in that. In that in that uh, in that arena, they've got confidence in the locker room. There's confidence in the coaching staff, and now you, you take the confidence and the competence, and you put those two together. And at some point, a Super Bowl comes. Like that, that's just what happens. Like, why 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 was Matthew Stafford able to win a Super Bowl in in, in LA last season? Well, guess what? Trust me, people were a lot more excited that he came there, and they didn't have to deal with, with Jared Goff. And not that Jared Goff was bad, but they felt like Matt Stafford was better. The defense played better. The offense played better. They moved the ball better. Like, it, it's it, it's mojo. So it's not all mojo. That there's other little things that are happening. But I think when, when you invest in your quarterback, you let them know, hey, we're behind you. The leadership picks up. The confidence picks up. The confidence picks up. And they start winning football games. Well, you look at the way that they did the captains on that team. Like every other team in the league, I mean – Teams in the league will you'll have a skill position player will do it and the quarterback and then a couple of guys. The Eagles did the Eagles uh, not that not that really like Devonta Smith was going to get it or Dallas Goddard was going to get it, but the quarterbacks the the captains that they had on offense were um, Lane and Kelsey and Jalen, which is basically saying our quarterback's the guy in the room and the guys that protect him are also your captains. Like that is it's sort of as a PR guy like I saw it as like a that's a message of like, this is our guy and the guys who protect him are like, like it is, it's his, this is his team. Like it wasn't like they wasn't Miles Sanders. Wasn't it? And I have takes on Miles Sanders up the wazoo, but um, it wasn't Miles Sanders. It wasn't Dallas Goddard. It wasn't any of these other guys like, you know, could have easily given it to AJ Brown, even though it was his first time on the team, but they didn't do that. And they, they're like, this is yours. This is your thing. And it, to the original point, which was all about like watching Tua and these guys who take the second steps, Watch Tua when the film is reversed and he's throwing with his right hand and it's a completely different experience in watching him. I still think that he has accuracy stuff to work on, but Josh Allen didn't have accuracy, didn't figure out his accuracy until year three. Oh, he was so, downright terrible. He was beginning. terrible. Yeah. He was terrible. And so I, a lot of our stuff with Tua comes from the fact that he's a left-handed quarterback. His blind side is completely different and us watching him is weird. I remember like, you know, like watching Kirk Cobain when you used to play guitar was weird. He's left-handed. Like watching Jimi Hendrix, like it's all it's weird, man. Like right, you know, right-handers are what are running on sports. But yeah, dude, he to him might be able to do stuff. But I, I think there's also King's like you're not sure on Miami. Miami has a 
this is a tough spot on Thursday for Miami. I don't know when this is going to air. This is a very tough spot for them against the Bengals. It's a very good spot for the Bengals. Yeah, we, we can definitely talk about that. Just to, just to wrap up the A.J. Brown discussion, that that guy is is a gigantic difference maker. Even when Tennessee won, but was without Henry, and without was without Julio Jones, and A.J. Brown didn't miss time too as well, but he made a world of difference on that team, and there were many metrics to, to show that. It's the perfect marriage with that Philadelphia system. There's no one else in the league you want running a seven-yard slant off of an RPO because the defense has no idea what the hell to do. Like, yeah. even if Devontae Smith misses time or whatever, like, it's still just terrible for defenses that you're going off instincts at that point. You can only watch so much film and like, no, the RPO is coming. There still has to be decisions to be made. And, um, you know, you picking out the captains with the lineman reminded me of when Tom Brady and his line did all those credit card commercials, you know, yeah. it was yeah. never Dion branch or, you know, it wasn't any of his, no. his receivers. It was the guys up front. Uh, not exactly the best analogy, but no, anyway, no, 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 it's the same kind of thing, <laughs> but, but Miami uh, in Cincinnati, I mean, hey, you know, Cincy still needs to rate the ship here. What What are your thoughts on that game? Tough spot. Um, you know, Miami kind of suddenly has a target on their back, right? Just like that. Like, here we are, undefeated early in the season. I mean, I, I – so the Miami uh, – the Bills ran 90 plays on Sunday. 90 plays. They controlled the ball for almost 40 minutes, and they lost. So – you now have a defense that's just sat that went through 90 plays and chief. I don't know if you started looking at this kind of stuff, but I've started looking at play counts now. Like when I go in things and snap, snap oh, counts. The, blitz, the, the blitz has it, bro. I'm oh, it's in. great. Yeah. It's, yeah. I, so I, I look at that and like, the thing is, I mean, they played in the heat and they had 90 snaps and now on a short week against the team that was able to, that, that game was over by the end of the first half against the jets. I, I also like, I, I, my favorite bet that I've made of the season <laughs> And Justin, you know about this, but I, I, I have this take on, on Joe Burrow's over interceptions, which is built around the fact that he lo- he had his appendix removed, and the last quarterback to appear in a Super Bowl and then immediately have their appendix removed was Ben Roethlisberger, and he threw for twenty three interceptions that year, a career high. Therefore, it's going to happen again. So I think that I don't. I, I think that Joe Burrow is um, a more talented Nick Foles, is what I like to tell people, but. Um, he, but the thing is, is like I think it's a terrible spot for Miami, um, and I do think that there's going to find that defense is going to be tired. They're going to find some holes in it, and the exact areas that you've talked about that they can't really control, they're very bad at controlling slants on the outside, and that is where um, that's where Chase feasts. Um, so, yeah. like, I mean, what I'm looking at is longest reception props for him across the board because just it's it's bomb time. So, yeah, I like that three and a half. Uh, number that since he's currently favored by like i can't wait to see the public numbers on thursday you know the public's gonna be back in miami right they're the darlings right now that's that's where the public's gonna be the public's gonna be on miami i think they're not looking yeah. at play counts no they're looking at the three and O team <laughs> mm-hmm. okay now so let me let me do this adam just just quickly sure. here so last week chase opened up i think at I don't know, anywhere from 75 and a half to 81 and a half. Now, that's a wide range, but sure. that, that but was seven, his range. And that's just his sweet spot's about 77, 78. Yeah. So this week opened up, and this is on prize picks. That's kind of my, my main jam because I don't have an actual sports book where I am. So I'm in South Carolina. So th- that's another reason I'm heavy on, on, on the prop sites. But so this week he opens at 71 and a half. Are they saying that it's such a short week for him? So are they that's saying that they think the Miami front is going to give Burrow enough problems that he's not going to be able to get off longer throws to him, which I don't know. I don't know if I agree with that. T Higgins is at 65 and a half. That's high for T Higgins. Exactly. It's an overreaction to what happened last week. I just like, this is the stuff I look at, man. It's like, wait a minute. They they shouldn't ever be within a six yard. Like, clear, okay, clearly T can get off, but Chase is still like the number. Yeah, one but T's a fifty. It's fifty five, fifty one to fifty five. Yeah. yeah, yeah, not sixty five. So yeah. same thing for Boyd. Like Boyd typically is going to come around thirty five and a half, forty, whatever. Like that's where he should be. He's not going to go off for sixty yards a game. And so, like, these are the things I look at with these overcorrections. Now, Tyree kills at seventy five and a half right out of the gate. 
and I, I, I'll buy that any day. Like the Jets. Well, they've been, anyway. they've been, they've been having his has been low too. Like his, yeah, it didn't, it didn't even cross seventy two until this. Until this is the first time I've heard it higher than seventy one in weeks. Right, right. And, and then yeah, there's a guy in my group chat. There's a guy in my group chat. Um, my friend Dan, who um, um, who just uh, who basically was like, if they're gonna keep giving me a crappy number on, uh. Tyreek Hill, or by a crappy number, like a great number. I'm just going to keep betting until the wheels come off. Yeah, that's all I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. He he crushed me last week, but I I I had I had to take I I felt inclined to either side with him or Waddle. Um, the answer was no, but uh, I I still felt okay about taking that L, especially with all the personnel Buffalo was missing. You're talking about the safeties and everything like that, but yeah, I mean that that's that's a low number. And, and in terms of Cincinnati. Like Jamar Chase still has the stranglehold on, on the. Bro, he still had I think twelve targets last week. Yeah, it's, had... it's not like his targets went away. He had ten. He's averaging almost twelve a game, um, and that's well ahead of anybody else. He he just owns the target market share, twenty seven percent target market share. T Higgins ten percent less, down at seventeen percent. I know that skewed a little bit from week one, uh, but still like. Now I'm going to be looking at that Jamar Chase number for sure. It's almost like Tyler Boyd doesn't exist. And we started seeing that at the beginning of last season when, when it was like, wow, T Higgins is the, is the real deal. Um, well, he's got different roles. Cause like his role really picked up in the, I mean, they got those injuries, but like in the playoffs, it's where he, they kind of just really started going from, cause everyone gets tighter towards the end of the season is what happens. Like, like Jamar Chase didn't have a touchdown, I believe for like the last, five or six games. Um, and that's where those guys came on. And it's just a cheese point that he made before, which is teams start like getting in a rhythm and picking it up. Like at this point last year, the Rams were, I believe like plus plus three fifty to win their division. Cause like they lost, they got blown the F out like multiple times at home. So um, it, it's just, these things kind of come together at a, at a different time. So. Got to talk about Bill's Ravens, right? <laughs> a gigantic one o'clock game. I mean, I, 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 this is another one of those, like, I love the, I'm hot. I'm very big on the Ravens, but it's great. I think it, I think it's a bounce back spot for the bills. The bills are very good. Do not let Sunday confuse anyone. The bills are probably the best team in the league. Yeah. I, I'm just like, I'm envisioning the Miami game. Right. And I know I shouldn't compare apples to oranges here, but like Diggs and Gabe Davis on the outside, that Raven secondary is still banged up. Pretty banged pretty up good. for like five years. I know, <laughs> like, <laughs> terrible luck, right? Like last pre last pre- training camp, they had like two ACLs, and then Dobbins went down, and then what? I know we're, we're talking offense, but they've been Ravens have been depleted for two years, pretty much, and uh, Lamar's just doing his thing. He's gonna get paid handsomely, uh, all things considered, I believe. Um, so you, you're with Buffalo. Do you like like the spread there? Do you have any interest in the spread or the total? Um, I'm I. I... The only early picks that I took, I took um, took the Vikings early, um, uh, and I took uh, uh, I took that that Bengals early this week. I don't like the and I took the uh, Jags. I took the Jags and the Texans. I took big numbers like on early, uh, very early on some folks. Um, or no, I didn't take the Jags. I did take the Texans. So sorry. So for this game, I'm gonna wait because um, look, it's it's basically priced to the fact it's like three and a half right now. So it's essentially saying. If they did this in Buffalo, we'd probably flip this. It's um, it's not a good. You don't want to ever want to be laying a hook on the as a favorite on the, especially on the road. Is it's a road game, isn't it? Or is this game in Buffalo? The game is in Baltimore. Game's in Baltimore. Even worse. Like I don't like that. So I'll probably just wait and just kind of see. Uh, maybe look towards the total, or maybe look towards Bills in the first quarter. Um, that it might be a, a good play. Just um, look, I mean, I love Baltimore, but like, I'm also not going to uh, I don't want to chase that just yet. Um, maybe if that maybe look, maybe something will happen. that will get to four. I doubt it, but I would take Baltimore <laughs> if it gets to four. But I love the Bills. I like the Bills in this game. And um, so I don't want to see what a line is telling me. The line's telling you that this game's actually not a field goal game. We just talked about the tendencies. The line's telling you that someone's scoring a touchdown late in this game. So I don't know if I want to take the team with three and a half and then risk some shenanigans right now. Chief, you got a take on this one? I mean, I, I feel like it should be fairly competitive, but um, I, I think this week might be the most points the Bills get scored on this this season. 
And, and, and I really mean that. Like, this this could be the game. I don't see too many other teams, you know, officially, you know, having to, to score points to kind of do their thing. I think Baltimore is going to gonna score enough points to make this very interesting. Um, I, I think if I'm going scores here, I'm – I'm probably going 31-24. Like that, yeah. That's what I got in my head. That, that's yeah. what I got in my I, head. Or, or something or, – or a weird thing happens and you somehow get like a 31-26 type of thing. Like it's that, – yeah. that's, that's – um, like this game isn't coming down to a Tucker field goal or a Bass field goal. This game is coming down to like someone scoring a touchdown in the last minute. Yeah. Yeah. Especially uh, with those quarterbacks, because these are two quarterbacks that are going for MVPs and want the ball in their hands at the end of a game. They're not; it's the game's not coming down to. And two coaches don't that don't kick field goals a lot. Don't kick like, field it's, goals. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Just glancing through some DraftKings pricing real quick before we get to story time, which is going to be a good one. And, and I and I may have to bounce right before story time because I've been alerted by my wife that if she's going to go deal with the baby, I need to go take the dog out, which maybe I could just do quickly now and then jump in so but we'll, we'll see sure so. i mean we, we are capable of talking a lot um <laughs> I, I i just i just want to like i know we talked about, you guys talked about the broncos at the top of the show russell wilson is 6700 against the raiders who uh, i've heard in this conversation they might stink so when, when if and when are denver gonna kind of get it together like that is such a friendly price here and a decent matchup what do you think of playing russell wilson this week on DraftKings? do you have any faith um, I mean, here's the deal with that team. And this is coming from a guy who I followed Nathan Hackett, Nathaniel Hackett for a while. It'd be cooler <laughs> if his name was Nathan. Um, but it isn't. It's Nathaniel Hackett. The reason I've been following him for a while, because he was um Syracuse OC under Doug Marone when I went to Syracuse. Um, and I didn't go then, but it was like when Syracuse was got good again, was for a year. Uh so he doesn't – the problem is is that you have new ownership with the with the Broncos and they just gave $250 million guaranteed to Russell Wilson. So he's going to win that argument when it comes down to who – how are we running this offense and how are we doing this. Like he's a terrible fit in that off, in, in a Nathaniel Hackett offense. Um, he's old. He's slow. He doesn't do pace well. He likes to improvise, but he, you know, doesn't want to rely on his running backs. He wants to – he honestly wants to do play action like a normal person and just do that. He's going to win that argument. And when that finally happens, when ownership is sitting them down being like, we have a brand, we just bought this franchise and just paid this guy. Like this is how it's going to work. I don't know how things are going to change because the play calling has been absolutely atrocious on that team. So, but I, I um, like, look, I don't like to take teams two weeks in a row usually. So like, I like the Raiders, like the Raiders kind of are going to Raiders have, been one score away from winning a lot of games so makes sense yeah and there's been basically an even split between Javante and Melvin Gordon and that alone is enough for Broncos Twitter to to wake up angry in the morning I suppose every day because especially uh season longers because they want Javante Williams to to be the uh you know low-end RB1 I just might not happen with the way the system is it just might not happen (laughs) this year um Chief uh you got any take on the Broncos and Russell Wilson this week I'll be right back, guys. I'm going to take the dog out while you do this. Yeah, please. Do your thing. Um, I think they win the game. Now, is it pretty? Maybe not this week. And I'm going to side with the Broncos kind of the way I've sided with uh, the Rams, if you will. Like, I think think it'll catch on. It's just early, you know? And they have looked rough in certain spots. But I think they'll catch on. Um, I think it'll all come together. He's got enough weapons, and they can run the football. Um, I think, you know, they just got to get on schedule. Even last night when they played San Francisco, like when you saw them get in a rhythm and get on schedule, like certain play, they, you could tell when they were on schedule, right? Run for first down, pick up five or six, okay, we're on schedule. Run on second down, pick up two or three, okay, we're on schedule. Play action. Out route for eight yards. Okay, we're on schedule. First down, play action. Hit Sutton for 12 yards. Okay, hand the ball. You know, they're on schedule. You can tell the play call is getting in a rhythm. And then they have to kick a field goal because it just it, it falls off the rails inside the 20s or inside the 30, you know. And, and so that's what I've, I've with with the Denver Broncos. And um, hopefully, you know, if they, if they get on schedule, 
I think they can score points. Like Russ threw for over 300 yards uh, in Seattle. It's not, it's not like he can't, you know, let the ball fly around when it, he's got to do it. But I think this team for right now, they've got to be on schedule. And they haven't been able to figure it out when they're off schedule. Um, you know, you, I, I think uh, Chris Collins were talked about it yesterday. They saw a little bit of Russ Matt, Russ, Russell Matt, Matt. He's collapsing in the pocket, about to get sacked. You know, he just kind of, you know, pushes the ball to, to Gordon. Gordon picks up, you know, 15, 20 yards and, you know, you know, it gets them out of a jam. But they don't need Russ to do that every every drive. Like, you can't have – you can't ask him to do that every drive. It's got to be, you know, when he needs it. Yeah, you got Josh Allen, 8,400. Lamar right there at 83. Um, I, I – I think Allen might have a field day with this Baltimore secondary. So uh, I'm very much interested in him. Uh, just, just breezing through here, looking at running back, uh, you know, Taylor McCaffrey, Henry, all the way up top. Barkley's at 8k against Chicago, uh, Nick Chubb, Atlanta, 7,900. Nick Chubb's look great. That offensive lines look pretty good. I like Nick Chubb this week. Um, anything specific out of these running backs catching your, catching your eye here, chief. Uh, I mean, Man, last week I uh, – oh, sorry, I want to make sure I wasn't mute. I didn't think I was, but I, I just wanted to check. Uh, last week I was kind of on the cheap running backs, and I don't feel like I got burned. I just feel like I, I didn't really – I didn't build well. I think I had a little bit too much Miles Sanders, if that makes any sense. I was really high on him just because of the amount of carries he was getting so forth and so on. But, you know, once again, they just – they handedly, you know, won the football game. So – um, I didn't really – it didn't materialize like I thought. But this week, you know, looking over these running backs, how, how do you feel about about this one? And, and this guy hasn't really had a, a game to, to pop off here. But Austin Eckler against Houston at 7,700 feels yeah. r- really interesting to me um, for a guy that hasn't had that big upside game yet. And it feels like this week could could be the week. I, I think he's he's popping off the page to me early as someone that that I uh, th- that I really like here. I think the Chargers in general are going to be a key cog to the slate. Are we going to get the overreaction with the egg they laid last week? Herbert still threw the ball forty five times. Like Mike Williams still is very talented, right? Like, is are people going to play the bounce back? I, I mean, it's Monday. I can't tell you how ownership's going to shake out. I'll probably be wrong. So. I think the Chargers matchup in general is a big piece of the puzzle of this slate here. You know, I was going to go through receivers, but you know, what's the point really at this point of the week? Um, but yeah, like, will the char are, are is the public going to back the Chargers bouncing back? You know, if not, then I might be playing some tournaments this week because I kind of like that. <laughs> I kind of like that take. You know, you know, we always play the talent, right? Yeah, absolutely. Talent and matchups. I, I think it's a big deal. I still like it. So there you have it. You know, Garrett Wilson, like, didn't break the stat sheet, but he had 10 targets again. So, you know, another cheap receiver has coming out party against Cleveland. Um, he's seen a lot of volume. He's the volume guy. Garrett Wilson's now the volume guy, as long as Joe Flacco is, is throwing the football. Well, listen, Joe Flacco, I must say, against the Steelers, that that's that's a prop I'm going to take if he comes in at 230 and a half this week. Fl- Flacco's been throwing that ball around. Uh, so I, I am in – on some Joe Flacco shares if he comes in too low again this week. I took him over 232 and a half against the Bengals, and, I mean, it materialized beautifully for me, so uh, I am in. All right. Without further ado, let's get into story time. And an official congratulations from me to you. I'm so happy for you. Long-time co-host. I mean, time flies. We've we've probably done hundreds of shows together at this point. So seriously, like, isn't that crazy? Hundreds, yeah. isn't that crazy? So uh, take it away. The floor is yours. So, ladies and gentlemen, story time. Uh, of course, I think a lot of people know I got engaged last week, and it was actually on a Tuesday. So we, you know, we could not talk about it on the uh, Food for Thought Pod, but uh, got engaged on Tuesday. Uh, it was really beautiful. Um, and I, I'm actually going to kind of take you guys through this. So 
Uh, I had already, you know, talked to her mom and dad. I talked to my mom and dad. This was the week before. I actually talked to my mom and dad two weeks before just to let them know. I uh, talked to her parents over the, the weekend before the proposal. Um, you know, I talked to uh, the pastor at our church. We, we actually do attend the same church. So I talked to the pastor there. You know, I just, everybody that I felt like I needed to inform a little bit early, I did. Uh, got some some friends and family uh, together, let them know that I was, you know, doing something at uh, a local restaurant here called a Bonefish Grill. Um, and, and Bonefish is a chain. It's not like a, a, a uh, just a Charleston restaurant, but I had everybody ready to go. So everybody's at Bonefish Grill uh, waiting for us to arrive. I did the proposal before I got there. And so I've got a really good friend of mine that lives in D.C. And uh, he um, he uh, he can't, he was going to be in town because he was, he was receiving an award. And so I think about a month to a month and maybe a week or two uh, prior, you know, we went out and grabbed some dinner. And I said, hey, Rav, you know, um, I said I'm proposing on, you know, September 20th. And so the significance of September 20th is it is the day between both of our birthdays. So mine is September 1st. Hers is October 9th. September 20th is directly in the middle. And um, so that's what we um, that's what we we decided to. Well, that's what I decided to do. We had kicked around the idea of uh, possibly like, you know, looking at a wedding on September 20th, but it wouldn't come on a weekend until 2026 or so, like a Saturday. So, of course, that's out. I, I could not wait to that long to try and marry this amazing lady. So uh, the engagement was the next best thing. I uh, And so she got home from work and she was still working, Lou. So I, what, in my head, and I, I'll, I'll lay out the plan for you, but I needed her to go upstairs and get ready for the dinner at a certain time because I needed to set up the proposal, set up the environment. So my friend Rav was going to be at the house at seven o'clock sharp. And he was so that he could, uh, he could take pictures and, um, you know, and, and record the engagement. And what I was going to do, she was going to go in, in the room, get ready. I was going to set up candles uh, on the banister uh, of the, the hallway upstairs. I was going to set up candles down the electric candles, by the way. I wasn't going to actually use fire for these. Uh, set up candles down the stairs. Uh, I had a chair, uh, a stool at the bottom of the stairs with a letter on it. For those of you that don't know, uh, I actually, we actually started dating because I crafted her a letter. I didn't write it. I typed it and sent it to her, and that's how we started dating. So the letter was pretty significant for the proposal. Uh, and so that was on a stool at the bottom. And I had rose petals, you know, there. And the rose petals would lead outside. And they did. Um, and we uh, we play this game called Culture Tags, which is kind of like uh, a version of maybe charades or something like that. And uh, what happens is there's like a hashtag and then some words. So, uh, like, if we were playing it as DFS players, it'd say hashtag DFS. And you'd see the hashtag DFS, but I've got the card that has the real words, and you've got to guess daily fantasy sports. Like, you would have to guess that. Uh, and that's how the game is played. So uh, I had hashtag on the door and then WYM outside, which is like, will you marry? And me, I was around the corner because when she walked down the walkway, she'd have to turn the corner and I'd be there, you know, uh, ready to, to pop the question. What ends up happening is she doesn't want to stop working. She's on her computer. And I had to kind of gently force her upstairs. So she goes upstairs and uh, I'm like, okay, so, you know, let's, let's get this going. She's upstairs. She comes out of the room and decides that she wants to wash a load of laundry. Now, mind you, I have this stool at the bottom of the stairs with, you know, with a letter on it. And so she looks down the stairs at the, directly at the bottom. She'll see it. And I'm like, oh, no. So I'm run, I run back to the stool, grab it, run in the kitchen, sit it down quietly. And I run back to the bottom of the stairs. I'm like, hey, girl, what you doing? Oh, I'm just washing a load of laundry. I said, oh, okay. All right, cool. You know, no worries. And so then she says, do I need to not wash laundry? I said, oh, no, 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 no. Please do whatever you need to do. And so uh, I get everything set up. I'm moving like a little ninja, setting up candles and all of that. And finally... Uh, I came upstairs, and I think she was about to come back out of the room, and I said, look, 
I need you to stay in the room and don't come out until I tell you. And she does that. I get everything set up. Um, and from that point on, it goes off without a hitch. I, I, I let her know. I say, hey, you can come out. She uh, and I stand at the bottom of the stairs and uh, she opens the door and then, bam, her favorite song comes on, her favorite romantic song. Because, you know, we're, we're, we're music junkies, so we've got favorite songs. But her favorite romantic song, that's playing throughout the house. She comes down. She reads the letter. And at the bottom, and so at the end of the letter, I say, hey, you know, P.S., you may want to turn off the music. Now, mind you, I'm outside. I wouldn't know when she was coming to the door unless I heard the music stop. So the music stops, uh, which means I know she's coming outside. I cue up another another uh, sentimental song. And so she's walking down the drive, down the walkway to the house. Mind you, she can't see me because I'm around the corner and she doesn't exactly know what's happening. And when she gets around the corner, you know, she sees me standing there with the ring box, of course. And then, uh, you know, I, I ask her and tell her, look like she's everything. And uh, I want to spend the, uh, the rest of my life with you, of course. And so I asked her that she want to marry me and she's emotional, you know, like crying In internally. She said she was crying into Like she said she was crying, but tears weren't coming out, which was uh, a new feat that I've never seen, but she, uh, she was super shocked. Of course she said yes. And, and now we're on our way to planning a wedding. So uh, we, and we're officially actually starting after this show. So we didn't do anything last week on purpose. Just want to enjoy it. Uh, but we're starting after this show. And so I, I couldn't be happier. Thanks for the, the lengthy story time this week. Uh, next week, I promise I'll get back to food takes. But uh, this was uh, a real special time. And, uh, and uh, thank you, everybody, for the well wishes. I appreciate it. Um, love this industry. Love the people in this industry. And I uh, could, couldn't be happier to share that with you guys. Man, you had a lot of moving parts to that whole sequence. That gave me anxiety just thinking about it. So yeah, oh, it was perfect, though. Stuff. Good stuff. I'm sure it was. And thanks for tagging me in that tweet. I felt like I got engaged too. So um, my phone was, I was getting congrats texts all day and I was like, oh, I feel pretty good. I feel pretty good. About <laughs> I, I did something. I must have did something. But uh, nah, man, that's awesome, dude. And I'm glad you pulled it off the way you wanted to in, in true chief fashion. Yeah, man. Yes, sir. Berg, you got any uh, any stories or. Any marriage advice for the for the new fiance over here? Uh, I already gave you the wedding advice before the show, which is basically no one's supposed to know something wasn't supposed to smell, taste, look that way unless you tell them. My marriage advice is um, uh, room. This doesn't sound sappy, but like continue <laughs> to find ways to make each other laugh because oh, the reality yeah. is the reality is that look. Marriage and everything else, like uh, being with someone, is like you really just want to be with someone who is not going to annoy you too much for the rest of your life. Like, because you're going to annoy each other, but it's basically it's <laughs> of course not annoy me too much. But honestly, the best feeling in the world, um, when like you know, nine times out of a hundred, it's like my wife is annoying me about something, but I love when we make each other laugh, and it's like the best freaking thing in the world. So. Cool. As she's upstairs dealing with our kid who won't sleep, and all I had to do was do a podcast and take the dog out. So, it's work. <laughs> it's work. It is work. She's yeah. getting sick of that one. <laughs> well, it's always work. Yeah, I work in sports, babe. Sorry. <laughs> not an eight to five. Nope. So, Definitely not. We even work on Rosh Hashanah a little bit. So anyway. <laughs> so far, that. so good. Yeah, I keep thinking of that meme. Have to <laughs> it's such me a great one. meme. It is. Uh, well, the yeah. best, the, the other one, the one on Yom Kippur is not as good because it's just a, a guy going like this, and I just put, I put, oh, I'm so effing hungry, um, and it's just that's it. But the the other one, like, yeah, there's the so far so good is. <laughs> oh, you know what else is a good one is the um. Uh, right around Passover, I do the leaven bread. Ain't nobody got time for that. That meme, that's, that's a, good a pretty one. good one too. Yeah, that's, yeah. So like that's it. it. <laughs> well, we we better we better shut up and get out of here since Chief has yeah. to plan a wedding. We're, we're stalling you from your wedding planning. We're gonna we're gonna. Get Did you? I DJ. So like, oh. I mean, I like not like just faking DJ. Like I actually DJ. So you know, save some costs. I'll come down there. You guys are gonna do it in South Carolina. I need. I want an excuse to do that. I watch a lot of Southern Charm, 
So <laughs> I will I will totally come down and I will absolutely DJ. I will tear the roof off. Interesting. For, Adam, I don't know if you know this about me. I'm a musician, actually. Oh, nice, dude. Oh, well, then, I, you know, I, I was drums, testing I play you. Keys. And you play, nice. I used to do all these same thing. I was, the only reason I started DJing is because I used to used to play guitar, and I was a front man for a funk band in D.C., and then I moved. Oh. You know, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to be a DJ now and make it. And then and now I like kind of produce stuff and jerk around. But, um, but yeah, man, my, my dad's a musician, and we have a piano upstairs. And, yeah, dude, that's awesome. What kind of what kind of stuff do you like? Man, uh, James Brown is my favorite artist for what nice. it's worth. Uh, yeah. JB, uh, but I'm 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 probably an oldies kid. A uh, whole lot of Earth, Wind, and Fire. A whole lot of Gap Band. We got a lot uh, of the same stuff, man. Whole, you, you know, I mean, like I like real music. And of course, you know, I listen to like R and B, jazz. I, sure. I played it all, but uh, that that genre from the JB era, Stevie Wonder. That like that, that type of my stuff. That's, that's Dude, I got song. this. Um, I mean, my favorite Stevie Wonder song is um, is "As," just because it's got like yeah. the greatest. It's got one of the greatest jams ever. Like that, just just that that the way like because like he's got that that Hammond just sounds so good, and it's just it goes deep, and I can't yeah. get enough of that track. But I I'm a big yeah. disco and funk guy. That's that's all the stuff I listen to, and I just can't get enough. And my parents they split time between Philly and New Orleans, and so like. Like all we do is listen to everything's got to have horns. That's that's kind of my yeah. thing. Everything's got. I like I had a horn band, so like that was the deal. So anyway, we should hang yeah. out more. <laughs> yeah, virtually, hey. just in general. Yeah. That was like, <laughs> really good. Come so. back, come back on food for thought anytime. I, I don't do anything cool like play instruments. So oh, I, that's I, crap, man. I don't, I, don't like... have, I don't have anything to say. So, uh, but you know, I'm gonna let Chief close us out of here since. Do it. Uh, since you had a really good week. So take us home, Chief. Yeah, man. It's been fun. Thanks for hanging out. This ain't your mama's podcast. And uh, it's food for thought. Week four in the books. Thanks, Adam, for joining us. Yeah. Thanks for uh, having thanks, me. Yeah. Thanks, Luch, for uh, always making this show, show wholesome. <laughs> and uh, you can find me at Chief Justice 06. You can find Adam at Berg. And you at can he- find Luch at Hey Rosenberg. Oh, yeah. At Hey Rosenberg. You know what? Too much slack on my brain. Mm. See, slack your works. bird. I wasn't that even works. thinking. No, it's all at good. At Hey Rosenberg and uh, Luch at D. Jake Carlucci.